What state in its right mind would want other powerful states located in its region? Most Chinese surely remember what happened in the past century when Japan was powerful and China was weak. In the anarchic world of international politics, it is better to be Godzilla than Bambi. This is neo-realism. Or should I say structural realism as it's otherwise known, because neorealism dispenses with classical debates about human nature and attempts to bring realpolitik into the realm of modern social science by focusing on how the structure of the international system drives states to behave. It is, as Gilpin contrarily put it, the science of peace. So stay with me and we'll chat an understanding of the international system that dominates some of the most influential policymaking circles on the planet. In this video, we'll tackle one building block at a time so that you can think like a neorealist. So whether you're studying international relations at university or not, this video will give you the lowdown on ideas that span the likes of John Mearsheimer and Kenneth Waltz. In a word, neorealism is about one thing, power. However, these ideas did not arise in a vacuum. If you want to go deeper into the origins of this way of viewing the international system, then you may want to check out this video on classical realism. But time is of the essence, so let's get started thinking like a neorealist. Part 1. Anarchy. To understand neorealism, we need to start with the concept of anarchy. Anarchy in international relations does not mean chaos and disorder, but the absence of an overarching authority ruling world affairs. If a treaty is broken and a state is invaded or a crisis unfolds, there is no one in charge able to enforce rules or effectively coerce all other states. To neorealists, this environment, this structure, compels states to compete for power. John Mearsheimer distills this understanding of anarchy down to five assumptions that do him logically lead to this perspective. It's important to note that these are academic Academic assumptions and therefore are not necessarily meant to directly reflect reality, but are reasonable tools for making predictions and understanding the world. First, great powers are the main actors in anarchy. Neorealism is thus what we call state-centric, focusing on the state as the primary focus of international relations and the driver of the international system. There is a long tradition in realism of focusing on big military powers as the primary actors in international relations. So not only is neorealism state-centric, but great state-centric. As Arthur Stein put it, for realists, history consists of the rise and fall of great powers. Neorealists often like to harken back to the words of ancient Greek historian Thucydides, that the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must. In an anarchical world, power determines who can do what they want. Second, all states have the potential to be offensive. As May, Rosalind and Steiner put it, the theory of realism asserts that all states, especially great powers, seek power. It is impossible to eliminate certain states from the free-for-all that is anarchy. So no neorealist argument will ever posit that a state can be pacified indefinitely. This also means that no actions can be interpreted as purely defensive. Building up defensive missile systems, for example, could simply be preparations for an intended conflict. Therefore, even though great powers are the main drivers of international relations, everyone is a potential foe. Third, the intentions of states are unknown to others. States are always making decisions based on incomplete information and having to make assumptions about the intentions of other actors. Power is therefore, in Benjamin Frankel's words, the hedge against the unknown and unknowable threats of the international system. And to this, there is no practical remedy. No matter how many international institutions you set up or treaties you sign, secrets are everywhere. Fourth, states seek survival. There are many arguments as to why states seek survival. For example, humans associate the survival of their state with their own survival. But most of these arguments lie outside the realm of neorealism. Neorealists do put a lot of stock in the power of nationalism, meaning the belief in the existence of and the good of the state. But why this is the case isn't particularly consequential. For whatever reason, states seek survival. And fifth, states are rational actors. What this means is that states, in their pursuit of power and survival, are capable of assessing the options in front of them and reasoning the most reliable course of action. This means that states do not take actions which they believe are self-sacrificial. While states can make incorrect decisions, they make those decisions with the goal of survival in mind. These conditions produce actors which are self-help, or egoist to use the technical term. So anarchy produces a collection of self-interested actors, and a series of self-interested actors are destined for conflict. And to understand a bit better how, let's look at the security dilemma. Imagine you bought yourself a wonderful cabin far away from civilization. The worries of city life are a distant memory as you sit by a log fire and spend your evenings watching your favourite YouTube channel. You always remember to like and subscribe and you even follow them on TikTok and subscribe to their Patreon. And one day you're out for a walk with your trusty dog and a knife at your hip for protection when you notice that someone else has built a cabin on the adjacent hill. They're even sitting on their porch so you exchange a glance and go on your way. And the next time you go on a walk you see them again sat on their porch and did they have a rifle last time? So when you get home, you dust off yours, clean out the barrel and keep it with you. 
just to be safe. And the next time they also have a dog, so you think to maybe go over some drills with yours, just to be safe. And what used to be a fence around their cabin is now more of a wall. It's actually getting hard to even see what they're up to. So you go home and you make a Molotov cocktail. And suddenly, there's a lot more insecurity in the system than when we started. The international system is essentially this scenario writ large. Both of us have the potential to be offensive. Our intentions are unknown. We both seek survival and we're both capable of reasoning the most effective course of action. We are therefore both simply reasonably reacting to the unknown intentions of the person on the adjacent hill. This is a security dilemma. It is impossible to increase your own security without threatening the security of others. Defensive actions like getting a new rifle or building a bigger wall will be inevitably interpreted as potentially offensive and tensions will rise. Now, for the most part, it's important to remember that to a neorealist, the domestic nature of a state's government does not impact their response to anarchy. Capitalist, communist, democratic, authoritarian, it doesn't matter. States are treated as unitary actors, meaning they are not regarded as having any internal complexity. This doesn't mean neorealists don't think states have internal complexity, it's just not what they think a theory of international relations is about. This is how states behave on the international stage because it's how they have to behave. To neorealism, states are what we call black boxes, and this essentially means that this theory does not have the tools to look within them, because no matter who is in charge, they are all in charge for the same reason. Part two, power. The neorealist understanding of power is very straightforward. Power essentially equals the state's military capabilities, guns, tanks, bombs, etc, etc. This narrow understanding is beneficial as it makes analyses a lot simpler, but also opens up the theory to being criticised for missing out what other theories perceive to be key factors. Neorealists also have the concept of latent power, and this is essentially the socio-economic factors that produce military capabilities. Things like population size, production capacity, land and raw materials. These are the factors which states can draw on to increase or sustain their power in a case of conflict. In the wars of the 20th century, for example, latent power was a major deciding factor in who would win. This narrow understanding of power then reinforces the notion and anarchy inherently leads to conflict because it limits the potential for cooperation. Military power is naturally assessed in relative terms and what this means is that the correct amount of power to have is dependent upon what other states have. It is defined by competition. States are constantly comparing themselves relatively to other states. Therefore, if you cooperate with another state for mutual benefit, then they might benefit more than you. They have a higher relative gain. So if you cooperate, one side will likely be gaining an upper hand. An important distinction present in classical realism but refined in Kenneth Walter's book The Theory of International Politics is the notion of revisionist versus status quo powers. Revisionist powers seek to reform the international system and its rules, particularly who's in charge, whereas status quo powers seek to maintain the current arrangement. It can be easy to assume that revisionist powers are the underdog and status quo powers are the powerful states, but this isn't always the case. For example, some scholars describe the US as a revisionist power. Because whilst it is the most powerful state, it consistently sought to reform key rules of the international system, such as creating exemptions to national sovereignty. But this distinction only exists to you and me as analysts. To states, they assume all other states are revisionist powers, for the reasons outlined in section 1. But now let's take a look at a few of the ways that power can arrange the international system. Something you may have noticed about neorealism is it deals very little in what should be. This is not the theory of an activist. However, one of the debates among the realists regarding the ideal arrangement of power comes in discussions of the polarity of the international system. Poles are great powers in the international system, like magnetic poles, they are the points around which power converges. Now, there are essentially three different kinds of polar system, which neorealists disagree on which is the most stable. Unipolarity, bipolarity, and multipolarity. Unipolarity is when there is one great power in the system. This is probably the least popular arrangement among academics and the most popular among governments. Proponents of this perspective argue in favour of a benign hegemon capable of enforcing an equitable arrangement of the international system and deterring defections. They may not be able to manage everything, but everyone knows who is in charge. The problem arises when a unipolar power begins to ideologically engineer the affairs of other states, as this can raise the overall insecurity and thus fluctuations in the balance of power. Bipolarity is when there are two great powers in the system, for example, the Cold War between the US and the USSR in the 20th century. Proponents of this arrangement argue that the low number of rivals keeps the two great powers from excessively managing and interfering in weaker states, as there is only one other power to balance against. 
Whilst there were many iconic and devastating proxy wars between the USS and the USSR, it was markedly more peaceful for the majority of the world than the 50 years prior. Only one rival also makes things more predictable, and you're not having to constantly assess and weigh the costs of actions against multiple actors. Multipolarity is where there are three or more great powers in the system, and the major advantage of this arrangement is that states don't become obsessed with each other. Their attention is diffused, and they have more to focus on than subverting their one rival. Multipolarity also makes deterrence easier, as if one great power starts to excessively flex its potential, the other states can quash it. For example, the forces of Europe uniting against Napoleon in the early 19th century, or Germany in the 1930s and 40s. So those are just some of the ways that power can be arranged in an anarchical international system that revolves around exchanges of military power. But there is a major division in neorealism that it's important to keep in mind. Part 3. Offensive and Defensive Realism Neorealists are largely divided into offensive realists, the most famous being John Mearsheimer, and defensive realists, with the most famous being Kenneth Waltz, and it's important to know the difference between the two. The first difference is a subtle distinction in what power is for, and it has major consequences. Offensive realists believe that states are power maximizers in relative terms. They therefore first attempt to seek regional hegemony, controlling their immediate area, and then expanding outwards from there. And a primary goal is also to prevent any other states from gaining control of their regions, keeping them stuck in contests with their immediate neighbours. They incline towards offensive actions to pursue their survival. Defensive realists, on the other hand, believe that states are security maximisers in relative terms. They seek what Waltz labelled an appropriate amount of power. A balance of states with as little conflict as possible. States in this view are not concerned with being able to conquer and control others, but merely to protect their own survival. They incline towards defensive actions to pursue their survival. A big cause of this division is a disagreement over whether conquering and controlling other states is worth it. Offensive realists point out that aggressors typically win wars, and therefore states seek to take over as much as they can. Defensive realists, however, point to the limitations on the acquisition of power. Logistically, the more a state attempts to control, the weaker that control can become. And this is compounded by the influence of nationalism, preventing conquered or subjugated areas from becoming pacified. Too much expansion can also cause pushback and mean that other states join together to oppose you. The thing is, the offensive realist prediction seems to be more reflective of reality. If we only look at the international system, states do seem to maximise power rather than just security. So defensive realists have to come up with a reason for why states do seem to seek hegemony, despite this being an unwise thing to do. And for that, they need a theory outside of neorealism, a theory of foreign policy that explains why despite security maximisation being the best choice, states seek hegemony regardless. Neorealism, in both its defensive and offensive forms, is confined to studying the international system. That is its level of analysis. Defensive realists posit that to understand the international system, you need another theory on the level of analysis below, which examines the inner workings of government. But let's focus on a case study that you will likely be familiar with to try and understand this distinction more clearly. On March 19, 2003, the US, UK, Australia and Poland invaded Iraq in violation of international law. The US cited the threat posed by President Saddam Hussein, in particular his alleged ties to international terrorist groups and possession of weapons of mass destruction. US politicians argued at the UN that Iraq posed a threat to the international community and that intervention was imperative to prevent disaster. Major combat operations lasted around four weeks, Saddam Hussein was deposed, hanged and coalition forces set about establishing a democratic government. The offensive realist take on the invasion of Iraq is relatively straightforward. The US has successfully achieved military domination of its own region and therefore in pursuit of global hegemony and power maximization, seeks to control other vital regions of the globe. The Middle East, and Iraq specifically, was of particular importance due to its oil reserves. The invasion of Iraq also signaled to other potentially revisionist powers that the US was willing and able to enforce its hegemony. The defensive realist position is slightly more complex and depends on whether you assume the US believed that Iraq posed a threat. Therefore, the first form this argument can take is to say that the invasion can be understood as an act of security maximization. This, however, hinges on the premise that the US sincerely believed Iraq to be a security threat. A preemptive strike was therefore understood in defensive terms. Alternatively, if you assume the US did not sincerely believe that Iraq posed a threat, then you need a separate theory of foreign policy to explain why the US refused to act in a security maximizing manner.
So that is neorealism, a theory that wrestles with anarchy, polarity, and power. In this video, we've covered the foundation blocks of doing analysis like a neorealist, so let me know what you think of it in the comments down below. You can also find more videos here and on my channel. This overview is explicitly uncritical so that you can understand neorealism on its own terms. If you want me to go deeper into some of the problems and perspectives of this theory, please let me know. And the more people who interact with this video, the more likely I am to upload more. So please do that. God bless you all, and I'll see you next time.